Hi, I'm Chris Kanish, and this is CS484, Secure Web Application Development. Today, we're going to talk all about APIs. So again, just like a lot of other videos on this channel, I'm going to assume that you have a computer science background, but maybe that you've never touched web development before. So a lot of this might be filling in some blanks. Might, a lot of it might be a little bit deeper than uh, a random YouTube viewer might be interested in. But this is what I think is most important for somebody who's a computer scientist to actually dig in and build a strong understanding of web development. So at the end of the day, an API is a function call. In this context, within the browser, within the web, they usually consist of the name of the function, or sometimes it's gonna be called the endpoint, the semantic meaning of that functionality. So if you're looking at the directory of all the different API calls that you can make, there will be some human English natural language description of what that API endpoint is for. There will be the required inputs, and that can both be kind of just normal function arguments like which user are you trying to look up the information about? Or it might be something more metadata-like, like an authentication token that you need to pass along with that request to make sure that the API knows that you're allowed to access that information. And then finally, we also have the format and the type of the output. These Having all of these here as well-defined pieces of information define an API for us. And these APIs can be backed by the browser itself, by a library, or by a third-party service. Another important thing here is that while I'm going to be talking about this within the browser context, you can just as easily access an API from a server context, anywhere that you have the ability to make HTTP requests, which is basically everywhere. So the most straightforward type of API is this native browser API. So we can get the current position of the user just by doing this. So I can even copy this in here. Uh, let's go to our console. Let's see whether it will allow us to do this. Let's send that in. It's going to ask me whether I want to use that API. I'm going to say allow, and then I'm going to get it back. So that's where I am right now. Pretty cool. An important aspect of this API is that I didn't have to include any libraries. I didn't have to sign up for any services. I simply used the facility that the browser provides to me to run position and then output the result. This can also be provided by libraries. So we have an example here of including a script. Like in this case, we can also use APIs as libraries that we call in rather than something that's just built into the browser, this Axios that we see right here. And then we can use that API whatever way that library is meant to be used. So you could take any website, shove this into the HTML and it will work. It will allow you to make these requests. So one thing that really confused me about web programming for a ridiculously long time was the difference between like requiring or importing some library into my web application, like in this slide, versus just doing a script source equal. Fundamentally, what's happening here is that script is getting evaluated within your browser's JavaScript context. So it is adding a new variable to the, the global window object called Axios, which is an object which allows you to run these functions that are inside of it. What we're doing in this situation is effectively the same thing, but rather than putting it directly into our HTML code, here we're using the node package manager as well as our bundler. In our class, we've been using Vite to put all of that information all into one place so that it can be packaged up and sent to the browser directly from my website if that's what I wanna do. So in this case, as you could imagine, everything after that first line is exactly the same and I could put this in my Vite code and it would just work. So this is an API that basically provides a way to utilize a library, use a bunch of code that does something useful like make HTTP requests. Those HTTP requests in all of these examples are going to the GitHub API. So here I can use a native API, the fetch functionality is built into the browser by default to access this third party API. And that will give me back the content of that thing. I can interpret it as an actual JSON object. I can deserialize it from a string down to a JavaScript object and then I can pull properties out of that object and print them to the screen if that's what I want to do. So this is asking a third-party API for something using a built-in API. This is using a library that provides an API to access the functionality of that library, and I'm going to do it through a bundler, or I could do it through directly including that script into my page. Finally, 
the fanciest way, perhaps, that you could say uh, of how you can access a third-party service that's provided via an API is that that third-party service provides their own library that you can use to access all of the functionality that that API provides. So we're using this OctoKit library to access the GitHub API. What this code is almost certainly gonna do underneath the covers is figure out, oh, I'm asking for username K2, I'm running the get, user, get by username function, therefore I need to ask this API endpoint for this information. All of this gives us the same exact stuff and what you'll see usually when you're using APIs in the browser, whether it's something like the Google Maps API, Google Drive API, if it's anything even moderately complicated, they're gonna give you a library to do it rather than ask you to just make raw HTTP requests. But the interesting thing, what I've seen when I'm building very simple applications is that this is usually really heavyweight. Sometimes it's complicated to understand. If I know I just wanna ask for one or two or three different things, what I'll very often do is just say, you know what? I know how to create these raw HTTP requests myself. I'm gonna do it. I'll attach the authentication token if I need to, and I'll send it and I'll see what happens. So one, one quick aside, this isn't 100% exactly about APIs, but this is an important part of web development. JavaScript itself doesn't have a standard library the same way that C or Python do, where the language itself says, oh, if you wanna use a whole bunch of different utility functions that we figure are, are useful, just include them. You don't have to download them. You don't have to install them. They're just there as part of the language runtime. This has led to some interesting situations. This is part of why the Node Package Manager is so incredibly popular. People need to bring in these third-party libraries to make their code work. And so they build all sorts of different things. There are even some like ridiculously simple things like the left pad function, which just takes a string and a number and left pads it out so that it is definitely that number wide in terms of characters by adding spaces to the left side of it. So if you wanna like write justify a bunch of text, you can say, oh, I have all these different strings and I'm gonna left pad them out to 30 characters. You know, what could possibly go wrong? Well, what could possibly go wrong is that the author of left pad got upset for some reason and just takes it off of NPM. And because this is such a simple functionality, but it's something that's super useful, it became really popular. It became really popular in libraries and libraries on the Node Package uh, Manager website can include other libraries on the Node Package Manager website to get their job done. So there were a lot of ridiculously important packages which relied on left pad to even work. And so when that author pulled it off, it's like there was a rug pulled out from under a huge chunk of the JavaScript ecosystem. It's a funny story to tell, but it does show how brittle this ecosystem can be in some situations. Another serious situation here that caused a security incident is that there's a very popular library called Event Stream, and I'm gonna get the story wrong, but the basic idea is that Event Stream relied on another package, and that package had its control taken over by some malicious entity. So what could possibly go wrong within our threat model? Well, if event stream gets compromised due to some downstream dependency and I use it to build my website, and then after I build my website, I deploy my website, and then anybody who comes to my website is going to be exposed to whatever nasty thing it is that that threat actor was intending to do. That's one way that this is bad. But the other kind of nastier way that this is bad is that the way that the node package manager works is I just run npm install and I type npm install event stream. And when I do that, the node package manager on my machine basically has full control, just like any other process on my machine, the developer's machine, where developers may have access to special keys, developers may have access to special services. That code basically can run arbitrary things through the node binary on my machine to do whatever the heck they want. So if they wanna find my .env file that has the secrets I use to deploy things or any other number of things that are on a developer for a real website's uh, dev machine, which if you're not doing a really, really good job at security, very often there are sensitive secrets on developers' machines. So I'm pretty sure what the exploit was, was that they were exfiltrating credentials from developers' machines through Node rather than 
expecting to be added to some production website. And then on that production website, they attack the users of that website. So your threat model, when you're thinking about using third-party libraries is not just how does this impact the performance of my website? How does this impact the security of my users? It's also how does it impact the security of my developers? Other runtimes like Deno and Bun are doing a much better job on security. And I think Node has cleaned up a lot of what Node packages can and can't do while they're being installed, but it's still a little bit on the dicey side. So TLDR to that story, choose your dependencies wisely, be up to date on what vulnerabilities exist out there. And if you can get by by not adding a dependency, by pasting in you know 30 lines of code from Stack Overflow that you actually understand because you read them and you're a decent programmer, then maybe you want to do that instead of NPM installing something which could potentially get updated whenever it gets updated and all sorts of nasty stuff can continue, can happen after that. So another important thing here on third-party APIs, we can more or less think about them as remote procedure call interfaces. There is code and there is data and there are compute resources that exist somewhere out there on the internet. And we want either our server to gain access to them or we want the client that's coming to our website to gain access to them. And that's incredibly powerful. This is part of why APIs are so popular is that we've built this gigantic distributed system where there are remote procedure calls and different code is running in different places and available to different people anywhere in the entire world. And this is an immensely powerful way to build new applications by taking advantage of lots of different code and lots of different data running in lots of different places. Now, besides the fact that that's just awesome, that's just me nerding out about how cool APIs are and why they do deserve a lot of the cred that they have, is that it's not just as simple as, oh, I chose an API, I'm gonna use that API, okay, great. If you're not too worried about the performance of your application overall, you can just kind of go with whatever. And in a lot of cases, when you're using a full-on third-party API, that third-party API is only really provided to you in one way. It's usually provided through HTTP. It's gonna be provided probably through either REST or GraphQL or both of those. And you're just gonna use it the way that the API provider decides. But if you're a engineer at a company that is trying to deploy an API, or if you are building a full stack application and you're trying to, and you have authority to control everything that is happening as part of your app, you're probably going to want to provide your own backend API and you're gonna connect that to the front end of the web client. And you have a lot of decisions to make about how to do that in a performant way, how to do that in a way where the software engineering works the way you want it to so that you can create new features, you can work well between different teams, all sorts of different choices that you're gonna to have to make. So changing gears a little bit here, instead of just talking about designing all of this cool stuff with using APIs, I'm gonna start actually showing you how to use these APIs. So because APIs in a lot of cases are just HTTP endpoints where I can send a request and receive a response, the easiest way for me to interact with them is to use curl. So if I come over here and I grab this HTTPS URL, come over to my terminal and I paste it in to a curl command, I'm gonna see the result. That's using an API. That's the long and the short of it. There's nothing fancy going on there. It's one of the most exciting, you know, fun features of Chrome is that if I pull up my dev tools and I make a request, I'm gonna re reload my Reddit inbox here come back over to my dev tools. I'm gonna to see that it is making a request of the oauth.reddit.com host. And this is an API. So we can see our response here is just a full on API response. We can see all the headers that are sent here, including my authorization token. So I'm probably gonna inv invalidate that before I post this video. But the coolest thing that I'm trying to show here is that if I right click on this request and I come in here and do copy as curl, I will get exactly the code I need to make that same exact request here. Yeah, so everything needed to recreate that same exact HTTP request exists right here. Super, super neat. And I can hit enter and I'm gonna get the response. Everything that's here is everything that I got here in this response. And that's really that's a really, really powerful aspect of 
developing for APIs, messing around with the website, trying to just figure out how it works. So many APIs have a playground or a console that you can use where they create both the docs for the API alongside some example code. One that I usually come back to as a good example of this is the Twilio API. So if you want to send or receive SMS messages with the code on your server, you can do that using Twilio. I think they have a decent free tier. I don't know whether it's still there or not. But one of the cool things about the Twilio docs is that they give you all of these different examples and they show you what the definitions are of all the stuff here. And then on the right side, in addition to our semantic understanding of, oh, what does this API do? We see examples to call it. You can call it from the server side in Node. You can call it from Python. You can call it from Java. You're in each one of these examples. Again, you're importing their third-party library, which is just a wrapper around how to make HTTP requests to the Twilio API that actually exposes that remote procedure call interface. Uh, and then the other neat part is that in addition to the Node example of showing how to send that message, you can also see how to do that exact same thing in curl. So the neat part here is that, yeah, you're gonna have some code that you have to understand how to instantiate this with your account ID and your auth token and yada, 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 and call this. But at the end of the day, all of these different endpoints within Ruby or Go or PHP or whatever, all they're really doing is sending this HTTP request with the correct data inside of it and giving you back the response in a format that you can understand. I think that's a really important thing to realize about APIs and Twilio's documentation is a really great example of that. So finally, one, one other thing about APIs that I haven't really gotten into is there's a GUI called Postman that allows you to experiment with APIs, allows you to record requests and manipulate them and develop against your own API if you're trying to do it or develop against a third party API, save like your auth tokens and allow you to repeat request over and over again, tweak them in ways so that you get what you're expecting back. I haven't used it that much. I know a lot of students have gotten a lot of use out of it. I know it's very popular, but I haven't used it. I usually end up going straight for curl or straight for JavaScript or Python to mess around with things. But if you like using GUIs to mess around with stuff, I highly recommend messing around with Postman. So now we're gonna change gears just a little bit, go on to how we're going to implement these APIs? What are we going to do to actually make them work under the... Now, here we're going to talk about how to actually implement these APIs. We do have a few different choices available to us. One of the most popular is the REST APIs, where you have a representational state transfer. So representational here means that you're going to receive a representation of the server's resource. Usually it'll be a JSON object. In the old timey days, you'd get a lot of XML objects. REST doesn't define, oh, should it come, does it have to come back in JSON? Does it have to come back in XML? Yada, yada, that they don't really care. The state is re represented by the stuff. So REST is transferring state because not only can you just ask for something by say, send, making a get request, you can update it by sending a post request or a put request. An important part of that is that when you say, oh, I wanna update a specific row, maybe you put something into the database, what is part of REST is that when you put that in, it's gonna respond with, okay, here's the new row that's been created, it has ID this, go and do whatever it is you need to do with it. The state is coming back and forth as part of these requests and responses and transfer, you know, that, that's kind of obvious here. We're moving that state back and forth as part of updating things. And it has a lot of benefits for thinking about how to do this software engineering, but it's a very hazily defined architectural pattern. It's kind of a recommended set of ways to do object-oriented programming via an API, via a remote procedure call that fundamentally runs over HTTP. It just allows you to think about it the way you would think about object-oriented things. You just think about it as there's a method that you can use to manipulate an object, manipulate the state of that object which lives on the server, but when you manipulate it on the server, it's gonna give that object back to you so that you can understand what change it is that you made on the server side. So it's not a standard, the return format isn't standardized, the resource naming isn't standard, standardized, basically none of it is standardized, it's just a high level idea for how to organize your code. And it's not super popular now, but it still kind of just works. It's just shorthand for HTTP APIs. 
Uh, for high throughput things, like anything that requires high performance, doesn't want to have a lot of overhead due to the actual mechanism you're using for providing the API, it's not that great. So gRPC is a way to send messages back and forth at a very, very high rate of speed with well-defined framing for the messages, well-defined uh, protobuf-based uh, protocol buffers, uh, based serialization of the data. So it provides you with high-performance serialization, high-performance remote procedure call, and throws out all the other crap that you don't necessarily need and is much more well-defined. That's uh, gRPC, obviously created at Google. A much better choice if you're doing something that just has to have a huge amount of throughput. So two other things that REST doesn't do well are aggregating multiple resources. If you are going to render a web page that say has a list of my followers and messages, maybe my uh, profile on a social network, you can imagine that with a REST API, you might have to make a whole bunch of different requests in order to actually populate that page. Uh, and likewise, when you're defining objects and the functions that you run on them, you're very tightly coupling the way that you access the API with the implementation of the API. That, that makes it very, very rigid in how you can use that API and especially how you can evolve that API over time. So GraphQL is a great new option for actually doing this. So to provide a visual example, in REST world, you can very often say, okay, well, what if I want to get all of the posts and followers of an individual user just to show them their homepage on, say, Reddit or something like that? In that situation, I've got to make three different HTTP requests in a reasonably designed REST world. I've got to ask for the user's basic information. I've got to ask for a full list of the posts that the user has made. I've got to ask for a full list of the followers that that user has made. So the two kind of bad things that are happening here are A, I've got to make multiple requests and this is going to slow things down. Even if I'm using HTTP2 or HTTP3, this is still going to slow things down, especially on the server side where I can't collapse these three requests, which will fundamentally turn into database queries into one query when in theory I could. You know, maybe there could be a slash users slash front page that aggregates all of those, does one quick efficient query, but I'd have to design it and I'd have to add it to my API and I'd have to explicitly state, oh, here's this new way to do this request here. And it would be a huge pain in the butt. So hard to evolve, as I mentioned earlier, uh, hard to ask for just what you want in one request. And in a lot of situations, you're gonna get things like, oh, a list of comments that comes back on each of those posts. Maybe I don't need to show the comments. Maybe getting those comments causes an extra really long database query that I didn't even wanna to have to deal with. And that's gonna make my entire interface much slower because I'm waiting for those HTTP requests and the database queries behind them to actually all resolve so that I can send all that information to the front end. GraphQL was designed with these problems in mind. So fundamentally, what GraphQL is doing is it's decoupling the front end implementation of how I ask for data and what shape it's going to be delivered to me in. So fundamentally, from my perspective, the benefit of GraphQL is that it's decoupling the front end and the back end implementation of creating an API. In GraphQL world, there's one endpoint where you are going to send any request that you ever, ever make, and all the data is gonna come back. And the two big things that we're gonna get here is that the client is going to exactly ask for the shape of the data that it requires. So you could imagine that in this situation, if what I care about is the username, the list of posts, the IDs of those posts, not the titles, not the comments, not the content, not any of that, and then the list of followers, including their IDs and their names, not their addresses, not their birthdays, et cetera, I could specifically ask the GraphQL endpoint, give me the user, give me their list of posts within the list of posts, give me the ID and title, give me their list of followers, within the follower, give me their ID and their name. Don't give me anything else. I don't need anything else besides that. I'm gonna make one request to the GraphQL endpoint. The back end to that GraphQL endpoint can do whatever optimizations it needs to aggregate that information for me in as few and as fast of database requests as possible, and then return it to me in exactly the shape that I asked for it in. In addition to these benefits over REST, GraphQL also provides a really useful schema and type system. There's usually a, a GraphQL playground that is instantiated alongside any of these GraphQL APIs that you deploy. 
and IDEs have extensions that will allow you to infer what the types are on these things. It just makes for better quality of life by providing better defined types on, and schemas on everything that you're doing. As you could imagine, this is very similar to the benefit that we get out of TypeScript, where we have a more well-defined type system that defines our objects, defines our APIs, and makes programming a lot easier, especially in an IDE that can provide us with the IntelliSense style features that are available because our IDE knows about what types there are for the variables that we're using in our code. The website How to GraphQL, I think it's howtographql.com, is a really, really great way to learn more about GraphQL. I highly recommend taking a look at that if you wanna be able to talk about it convincingly in a job interview. Okay, so a few other topics that I'm not gonna go into deeply right now, I might cover a little bit later on in class, are the ideas of ORMs. They basically provide an API, but it's an API for your database, where in no ORM world, you literally write your own SQL queries to ask for the things you want out of the database. What an ORM does is it provides an API on top of that. In general, I think myself and a lot of other software engineers kind of see ORMs themselves as a useless abstraction that doesn't provide as much value as the complexity and the difficulty that they introduce by adding them. The one kind of exception that I've seen recently is this, I think you, can't really call it an ORM, but it functions as an ORM, this idea of TRPC, which is a TypeScript-based remote procedure call mechanism that allows you to run remote procedure calls from a client to a server, where from your perspective as someone writing TypeScript, you're literally just calling a function that is a TypeScript function, therefore its arguments have specific well-defined types, its return values have specific well-defined types, but the TRPC runtime is taking that TypeScript function that you're calling, turning it into an HTTP request, sending it to your backend, which is also written in TypeScript, which will deserialize that into a function call where you implemented that function on the backend, and you can just do RPC the traditional way of, oh, I think I'm calling a function locally, but I'm actually calling a function remotely, and that's super, super helpful in the specific situation where you're building a full stack application where the front end and the back end are TypeScript, you can get a lot of developer productivity out of the ability to keep track of how you call things from the front end to the back end and how you receive those responses back. Super, super helpful. Anyway, that's what I have for APIs today. Hopefully this is helpful. Another class of APIs that I didn't talk about are OAuth based APIs. That's gonna be the next thing that I talk about. It's a pretty substantial area where we talk about delegating responsibility. We had a few previews of this earlier on in class, but we're going to see it in much more detail next week. Hope you have a good time and I'll see you next time.